Chapter Thirteen of the Lady of the North Star by Otwell Binns. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Two proposals. Three days after her visit to the theater with Sir Joseph Rayner, Joy Gargrave went north to Westmoreland, accompanied by Miss Lafarge. She was staying with old friends a few miles from the home of Sir James Bracknell at Harrow Fell and her hostess, remembering Dick Bracknell's devotion to her, gossiped freely. "'You remember Sir James's eldest son, the one whom we used to say ran on your heels, Joy?' "'Yes,' answered Joy, in a voice that was not very encouraging. "'He went to the dogs all the way. There was a bad scandal, and though it was hushed up for Sir James's sake, Dick Bracknell had to run the country.' No one knows where he is now, or whether he is alive or dead. But it is thought the latter. Anyway, we are all beginning to look on Geoffrey as the heir of Harrow Fell. He is coming over here at the weekend for the final grouse shoot of the season, and Adrian Rayner is coming also. Your uncle fished for an invitation for him, and my husband could not very well refuse, you know. I fancy, she added, with a knowing little laugh, it isn't merely grouse he is after. Joy gave no sign of understanding, but when the weekend arrived, bringing with it Adrian Rayner, she was left in no uncertainty as to her cousin's intentions. He haunted her steps, he was always at hand with assistance which she did not want, and when Geoffrey Bracknell arrived, there was something like open rivalry between them. Her friend and hostess laughed. You will have a brace of proposals before the shoot is over, Joy. Not if I can help it, answered Joy quickly. You will not be able to help it, was the reply. They are both determined young men, and their minds are made up. So is mine, replied Joy. Yet it was as her hostess said. On the day of the shoot, Geoffrey Bracknell walked with her across the moor towards the butts, built of turf, behind which they were to wait for the driven birds. They reached her own shelter first, and as she dropped to an improvised seat, Geoffrey Bracknell halted and looked down at her. "'Miss Gargrave, there is, uh, something that I want to say, and to, uh, ask you.' She looked up and met his honest eyes, eyes that to her mind recalled not his brother, her husband, but the eyes of his cousin, Corporal Bracknell, of the Mounted Police. What she read there brought a quick flush to her face, and she hastily put up a protesting hand. "'Please, Mr. Bracknell, don't. Don't spoil our friendship.' "'Ah,' said the young man, his face paling a little, "'you understand what I want. Is it really quite impossible?' "'Yes,' she answered with directness. "'It is quite impossible.' Geoffrey Bracknell whistled softly to himself. He had suffered a blow but he strove to behave like a gentleman. "'Then I am sorry to have troubled you, Miss Gargrave. Of course, I knew that I was not er, uh, worthy.' "'Oh, it is not that,' she intervened in a distressed voice. "'It is something else. It has nothing to do with you at all.' "'But it knocks me out,' he said, trying to smile. "'Well, it is the fortune of war, I suppose.' that I shall have to persuade the governor to let me go on a big game trip now. That is the proper thing to do under the circumstances, isn't it? Again she met his eyes. He was still smiling, but she could see the effort it required. She held out a hand impulsively. Geoffrey, she said, don't let this spoil your life or our friendship. I cannot explain what makes my refusal imperative. Some day I may be able to, and when I can, I shall tell you, if you are still my friend. Then you'll have to tell me, he said frankly, for I shall always be that. Couldn't be anything else, you know. But there's the headkeeper signaling. I must move on to my own butt. Good hunting. He laughed with forced lightness and walked away. Joy watched him go with pain at her heart. How like his cousin he was and how unlike his brother. She felt very sorry for the boy, and the incident had disturbed her so much that she shot very badly. 
Again and again, as the birds came driving towards her, she either didn't fire or fired too late. But from the butt where Geoffrey Bracknell waited, the shots came at regular intervals, and she saw the birds drop every time. Then a covey of grouse came driving with the wind straight towards her neighbor's shelter. She waited. There was a sharp report and a sudden cry, and the birds drove on. She looked towards the shelter. It was almost in a line with her own, and she could see something lying on the ground behind it. Another flock of birds drove down the wind, but there was no shot from Geoffrey Bracknell's gun. A sudden fear assailed her. Leaving her own gun, resting against the turf wall, she ran towards the next butt. Before she reached it, she knew that something dreadful had happened, for she could see that the young man was lying on his back in the heather. She reached the shelter, and a cry broke from her. White-faced and still, with a ghastly wound in his right temple, Geoffrey Bracknell lay there quite dead. As she looked at him, she had no doubt whatever about the matter, and a great agony surged up in her heart. Had he? Her eyes fell on the gun close by, and before the thought which had assailed her was completed, she knew that it was groundless. The lock of the gun was blown out, and the base of both barrels was fractured. It had been an accident. Thank God, she whispered to herself, delivered from the fear which had assailed her. It was not. She dropped on her knees by his side and took his hand. It was already cold as she raised it to her lips. Poor boy, poor boy. She was in tears as she rose from her knees and began to walk towards the next butt. The news spread quickly, and the shoot was stopped, and the body was taken first to the village, and later, in the day, to Harrow Fell. And that night, Joy's hostess, discussing the tragedy, set a problem before her, which kept her awake far into the night. "'Poor Sir James,' she said, "'he is left without a child.' For as I told you, no one knows anything at all about Dick Brack now, and it doesn't matter very much whether he is alive or dead to anyone but his cousin Roger, for he never can return to England. To his cousin Roger, echoed Joy, visioning the corporal. Why should it matter to him? Because if Dick is out of the way, Harold Fell will pass to him on Sir James's death. The estates are entailed, you know. Instantly Joy saw the difficulties of the situation. Dick Bracknell might be dead, or he might be very much alive. In the former case, the way was quite clear for his cousin, but in the latter there were possibilities that filled her with dread. The corporal had left North Star in an endeavor to solve the mystery of the disappearance of his cousin's body. If Dick Bracknell were yet alive, and he overtook him, he would probably try to effect his arrest. And if Dick resisted, there might be trouble, and possibly Corporal Bracknell might be driven to have recourse to arms. Suppose he shot his cousin, and so, in innocence, cleared his own way to the succession of Harold Fell. Her face clouded, and an anxious look came into her eyes. She was recalled to herself by her hostess's voice. A penny for your thoughts, Joy. Joy prevaricated a little. I was thinking what a strange coil life is, she answered. In what way? Well, the last person I spoke to before I left North Star to come to England was Roger Bracknell. Roger Bracknell, echoed her hostess in surprise. Yes, he is in the mounted police, and, in the way of duty, he came to North Star three days or so before I left. That is an odd coincidence, was the comment. What did you think of him, my dear? Joy answered with reserve. He seemed to be very nice, a gentleman, you know. Her hostess smiled. Yes, Roger is that, the right sort, as my husband would say. He, at any rate, will never disgrace the Bracknell clan, for he is at the opposite pole from his cousin Dick. What did he look like? Like a mounter, answered Joy quickly. A mounter? Don't talk slang, Joy. Interpret, please. 
Well, answered Joy smilingly, a mounter is a member of the Royal Northwest Mounted Police, who are as fine a body of men as you may find from one end of the empire to the other. And therefore Roger Bracknell is a fine man, hey? He struck me as being so, answered Joy composedly. Her friend glanced at her with shrewd eyes. Hmm, she said. You are very discreet, my dear Joy. Now you know that the truth is that Roger Bracknell is a man who takes the eye, a handsome man, in fact, and why should you be reluctant to own up? Own up? What do you mean? interrupted Joy, her face growing suddenly scarlet. Nothing, laughed her friend, except that Roger Bracknell is a man to whom few women could be as indifferent as you pretend to be. But I must cut this conversation short. There's Adrian Rayner looking for you and coming this way. I'll send him on to you. Please don't, cried Joy. But her hostess only laughed, and as she walked towards the young man, Joy fled to her room. Late into the night she considered the possibilities which had presented themselves to her mind at the mention of Roger Bracknell's possible succession to Harrow Fell. And in the morning she rode to the post office in the neighboring country town, and there dispatched two cablegrams, one to Roger Bracknell, care of the police commissioner at Regina, explaining to him the circumstances, and one to the commissioner himself, asking for the whereabouts of Corporal Bracknell, prepaying a reply. Three days later, the reply reached her in London. Corporal Bracknell reported as missing, supposed lost. When she received it, she was greatly distressed, and rather hurriedly made up her mind to return at once to North Star. Why should she do so? She did not make clear even to herself, and when Adrian Rayner pressed her for her reason, she was covered with confusion. Joy, he protested, you must not do anything so foolish. You have fulfilled the terms of your father's will to the letter, and now your place is here in England. We all want you here. I want you more than anyone else on earth. Do you understand? She gave him no reply to the question, but he explained further, leaving her no room for doubt. I love you, Joy. I loved you when you were here in England three years ago. I loved you at North Star. I love you more madly than ever now. Will you marry me? I can't, she said. Don't press me, Adrian. But why can't you? he asked ruthlessly. At least you owe me a reason for refusal. I wonder if that reason has anything to do with this foolishness of returning to North Star. She was a little startled by the acuteness of his conjecture, and did not immediately reply. He smiled a trifle grimly, and then continued, if it has, you can dismiss that reason from your mind for good. Dick Bracknell is dead. Dick Bracknell? What? Her voice faltered as she met his gaze. Yes, he answered, Dick Bracknell, alias Kuna Dick. He was your husband, wasn't he? You married him down at Alcombe, didn't you? How do you know? she asked quiveringly. That is a private matter, he replied, just as your marriage was private just as the manner of your husband's death must be kept private for the good of us all. What, what do you mean, Adrian? she asked, in a trembling voice, her face ghastly with sudden terror. I mean that I know who shot Kona Dick, he answered slowly. Oh, she gasped, her hand over her heart, in a wild endeavor to stay its fierce beating. Oh, what, what? There is no need for you to be other than frank with me. I saw the whole thing. I saw you get that message. I followed you into the woods. You took a gun with you, and you hid in the trees where you could see your husband arrive. I saw the flame of your shot, and that same second Dick Bracknell fell in the snow. Mark you, I do not blame you. Dick Bracknell was worthless, and... But, oh, sobbed Joy, with horror in her face, you are mistaken. It is not true. I never... Why try to bluff me, Joy? I say I saw you, and if you were not the person who killed Dick Bracknell, why did you make no mention of what had occurred when you returned to the lodge? 
That is not the way of innocence. Joy did not reply. Her face was buried in her hands, and she was sobbing convulsively. Rayner looked at her with shrewd eyes, and then, after a moment, resumed in an altered tone. As I have said, Joy, my dear, I do not blame you. I even went out of my way to help you that night. You? You went? Exactly. I saw that policeman find Dick's body, and afterwards leave it, and go towards the lodge. I knew that things might be awkward if the truth came out, so I disposed of the body. You disposed of the body? She lifted her head suddenly, and through her tears looked at him incredulously. Yes, he answered airily. It is difficult to prove a crime if there is no evidence of it. So I removed the material evidence. To the other confusion of any theory that Corporal Bracknell might have formed. But how? What? I carried it away and dropped it through an ice hole in the river. It will never be found until the ice breaks up in the spring, and then it is not at all likely. I took a little risk, I know, but I did it for your sake, believe me, Joy, quite as much as for my own. I do not understand how it affected you, faltered the girl. Perhaps not, answered Rayner suavely, but you have heard the reason. I loved you. I wanted to marry you, even at that time I wanted you, for I recognized that you were distraught when you... Oh, please, please don't say it, she cried. Very well, he answered, I will not. But you understand the position, and I think you will agree that knowing what I know, there are not a great number of men who would wish to marry you. And why should you? she asked quickly. Again, because I love you. She sat there in silence, staring absently at the vase of chrysanthemums on the table, and seeing them not at all. In her mind she was again living through the horror of that night at North Star, searching for something that would give the lie to Adrian Rayner's statement. And suddenly she remembered something, the sled which had halted in the wood. Who had been with it? Her gaze moved quickly from the vase to her cousin's face and on it she surprised a cynical, calculating look that stirred deep distrust in her. You say you dropped Dick Bracknell's body through the ice? It was rather a long way to the river. How did you get it there? For one second Rayner hesitated. He was not sure of the bearing of the question, but after the brief hesitation he answered, I carried it, of course. Joy marked the hesitation and to her came the swift realization that he was lying. She marked his slim form and remembered Dick Bracknell's height and bulk, and the sudden conviction deepened. But she gave no hint of it to Rayner, who stood watching her, sure that he could bend her to his will. She offered no comment on his reply, but thoughtfully twisted a ring upon her finger, while her mind sought for a way out of her immediate difficulty. Well, Joy, he asked, will you marry me? She rose abruptly from her chair. No, she said, on sudden impulse, not on the evidence of Dick's death that you offer. I cannot consider. You are not wise, he interrupted. You are in my hands, remember? Oh, but you mistake me, she cried. I am not saying that I will never marry you. I am only saying that the evidence of Dick's death is not sufficiently convincing. She lifted a hand as he would have interrupted her. No, let me finish. When we left Corporal Bracknell at North Star, he knew that I was Dick's wife, and he undertook to find out what had become of Dick's body. There was someone else in the woods at North Star that night, someone who probably witnessed all that occurred. That person, I fancy, Roger Bracknell means to find. And when I have heard that man's story... You shall certainly hear it, for I will find that man myself. I will drag him across the world to tell it to you. He spoke vehemently, passionately, but in his bearing there was something beside vehemence and passion. His face had gone white, and in his eyes was a furtive look. Joy noticed these signs, but gave no indication of having done so. You, she cried, you will go. What will you be able to do? Yes, he answered sharply, I will go. I will do what your bungling corporal has not been able to do. 
I will bring you proof of Dick Bracknell's death. I will find that man who was in the wood, if there was a man. There is no question of that, she broke in. I found his trail, and Corporal Bracknell found it too. I believe he followed it. Ah! The expression on Rayner's face as the interjection broke from him was one of mingled chagrin and fear. Joy noticed it, and it set her wondering again. Then quite suddenly she remembered something. Roger Bracknell had asked her if Adrian Rayner knew of her marriage with her cousin. She had answered that he did not, but he had known all the time. The significance of the question had not made itself felt at the time, but now it broke on her with startling force, and Rayner saw that something had happened to which he had no clue. "'What is it?' he asked sharply. "'Nothing,' she answered evasively. "'But in view of all the circumstances, I think, I shall return the North Star myself before long.' He was about to reply when there came an interruption. Miss Lafarge entered the room. The car is waiting, Joy, and we are behind time. We really must be going if Mr. Rayner can excuse you. Right, Babette. Cousin Adrian was just about to go, as we have finished our discussion, I believe. Rayner nodded. Yes, he said. We have finished, and I am going. But I shall see you again, Joy, very shortly, certainly, before I go to the north. Joy nodded, and making his adieu, Adrian Rayner passed out of the room. End of chapter 13、Chapter 14 of The Lady of the North Star by Otwell Binns. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Missing. Mr. Rayner is going north? questioned Miss Lafarge. Yes, he's going to Canada, and so am I, as early as possible. You will not mind accompanying me, Babette. Mind? I shall be more than glad to get back to the silent north. This noisy London gets on my nerves, and the smell of the streets is horrible. It is petrol everywhere. The place reeks of it. And after the aromatic spruce woods, the air here is like poison. I shall rejoice to go and hear the bell of the moose again in place of the hideous motor horns. She looked at Joy as she spoke, and there was a question in her eyes. Joy nodded. Yes, I will tell you why we go. My cousin Adrian has just asked me to marry him. Indeed, but I'm not surprised. The signs of the weather have been unmistakable for a little time. And of course he does not know of Dick Bracknell. But he does. He has known all the time. He even stooped to use his knowledge so as to bring pressure upon me. How shameful! Yes, but that is of small moment. You don't see the significance of the fact that he had knowledge of my marriage? He was aware of it all the time, and as you know, he made love to me, even at North Star. Yes, yes, but you do not think that he fired the shot which... I do not know what to think. I'm going to find out. One thing I am sure, and that is Cousin Adrian is afraid of what Corporal Bracknell may discover, and Corporal Bracknell has disappeared. He may have learned much that I want to know, and something may have befallen him. He may even be dead, but if he is alive we must find him before Cousin Adrian does. Do you understand? Yes, I think I do. You have grown afraid of what Mr. Rayner may do? I do not trust him. I cannot after, she broke off. I am my own mistress now. There is no need that I should consult anyone as to my comings and goings. We will go down to the steamship offices at once. We will not waste even a moment. An hour later they entered the office of a famous shipping company in Cockspur Street. There they inquired for a boat sailing for the Dominion. There is the Argonaut. She sails from Liverpool in three days. I believe there are vacancies. The clerk turned away and presently came back with a list in his hand. The accommodation is limited, I find. There are only a couple of cabins deluxe. 
"'We will take them,' said Joy promptly. "'Thank you. What names, miss?' The names were given, and within ten minutes the transaction was completed, and Joy left the office with the tickets in her handbag. Just as her car started, a taxi approached from the opposite direction, almost collided with it, and it was only by a decidedly dangerous swerve that an accident was averted. The taxi driver glanced round at his passenger as if expecting a rebuke, but to his relief, the man was leaning far back in the corner, as if anxious to avoid observation. The vehicle drew up at the shipping offices, and the passenger left the taxi and entered the offices. He was Adrian Rayner. The clerk who had completed Joy's business attended to him, and listened to his request. "'Sorry, sir. The last two cabins on the Argonaut have just been taken. There isn't a vacant berth in the ship. Rayner considered. He had not the slightest doubt that Joy Gargrave and her foster sister had taken those cabins, for he had seen them leaving the offices. A dark frown came on his face, which the clerk misinterpreted for disappointment. An idea occurred to him. "'You're in a hurry, sir?' he inquired. "'Yes,' answered Rayner shortly. "'Well, sir, if I may venture to suggest it to you, the Maple Leaf sails at six o'clock from Southampton. She is not a full boat, and if there is a train, you might yet catch her. Look at the timetable quick, was the reply. The clerk obeyed. There is a train in three quarters of an hour, sir. It is a slow train, but it is due in Southampton five and twenty minutes before sailing time. You should be able to do it easily, sir. Then I'll book a cabin, please, as quick as you can. I've some luggage to pack. A few minutes later he left the office and raced to his chambers, where he kept the taxi waiting while he packed the small portmanteau. Then he rang up Sir Joseph Rayner at the office. It was the head clerk's voice that replied. No, Mr. Adrian, Sir Joseph is out. He will not return today. Any message, sir? Yes, let him know somehow that I am going to America this evening. Tell him I will write, and, uh, Benson, remember that this piece of news is strictly private. Yes, Mr. Adrian. He hung up the receiver, lit a cigar, and five minutes after was on his way to Waterloo. What are you going to do, Joy, when we land? As she asked the question, Miss Lafarge turned from contemplating the grayness of the winter seascape and looked at her foster sister. I'm going straight through the Regina to find out if anything has been heard of Roger Bracknell. If they have no news of him at the barracks, then we will go north and ourselves try and learn what has befallen him. He may have news for me, and I certainly have news for him. Do you mean that we shall set out to search for him? Just that, Babette. We know that he was going up the river, and I have a fancy he was following a trail which I myself noticed. You and I know the country well, and with the Indian George we could look for him. At least we may learn something about him. Yes, replied Babette thoughtfully, and if we find him, as you say, he may have news. You may learn what really happened to your hus. Please, please, Babette, don't call Dick Brack now that. I can't bear to think that I am bound to him at all. No, and if he is dead, you are released. What do you really think, Joy? I am in doubt. I have always been in doubt since that night. It was so strange that he should disappear. Sometimes I hope that... She stopped, and after a pause continued. It seems too dreadful a thing to say, but I cannot help feeling it. Dick Bracknell behaved shamefully to me. Apart from all that has happened since... I can never forgive the humiliation of my marriage. It is the simple truth that I should be glad to know that I was free, even if it were by Dick's death. But I cannot feel that he is dead. Something tells me that he is alive, that we shall yet meet. I devoutly hope not, broke in Babette fervently, for if we do, I shall be tempted to... to... To what? asked Joy sharply. To shoot him myself, answered the other grimly. Babette, 
Oh, you not need look so shocked, continued Babette. You and I have lived in the North, and we know that justice does not always follow the forms of law. And what is it that man Kipling says? There's never a law of God or man runs north of 53. We're north of 53 at North Star, and a law until ourselves. If Dick Bracknell is still alive and came worrying you, I think that I could. Babette, you must not say it. Very well, I will not, but all the same I feel that I could, for the man is worthless, mere vermin, like the wolves in the north. And that woman, Lady Alcombe, of who you told me? She is dead. I learned that in England. She was killed in a motor accident. It was too merciful an end for her, said Babette quickly. She ought to have lived to feel remorse gnawing at her heart day by day and hour by hour. Lady Alcombe was not the kind of woman to suffer that way, said Joy slowly. She had no heart. But here comes the rain. We shall have to go below. Nine days later, Joy Gargrave walked across the snow to the headquarters of the mounted police at Regina. She asked to see the commissioner. He, as it appeared, was absent, and the only official immediately available was an inspector, a pleasant soldier-like man in his early thirties. To him she addressed her question. "'Can you tell me anything as to the whereabouts of Corporal Bracknell?' The inspector looked up from her card and flashed a keen glance at her, then shook his head. "'I'm sorry, Miss Gargrave. We should be glad of news of Bracknell ourselves. He went out on a journey several weeks ago, and a patrol that has come through the district where he was likely to be has heard nothing of him, though a sled was found which was unquestionably his. There were bones of dogs also, so that things look rather black. The timber wolves may have got him. Reports from two or three districts state that they have been very savage this winter. Joy's face went white, but she kept herself in hand. Still, I suppose there's a possibility that he may have escaped. A bare possibility, answered the inspector, in a voice that betrayed he had little hope. Then he asked suddenly, I wonder why you wish to find him, Miss Gargrave? Joy flushed at the question, which to her seemed the border on impertinence. It is a private matter, she answered shortly. Please do not be offended, Miss Gargrave. I had a reason for asking. You are the second person to make an inquiry about Corporal Bracknell this week. Indeed, said Joy, growing suddenly alert. Yes, a gentleman came here with the same question four days ago. Did you see him? Would you mind telling me what he was like? The inspector laughed. There's no reason why I should not, as it is not a police matter. I can do better than give you his description. I can give you his name, for I have his card somewhere. He fumbled among some papers on the desk, and in a moment found what he sought. Here it is, Adrian Rayner, Albany Chambers, London. Adrian Rayner? As Joy echoed the name, the inspector glanced at her keenly. You knew him? Yes, she replied slowly. He's my cousin. Indeed, said the officer politely, and then added, Mr. Rayner was anxious to learn where Corporal Bracknell was, but on learning that Bracknell was missing, he did not seem greatly perturbed. I gathered that Mr. Rayner was a lawyer, and that it was on legal business that he wished to see Bracknell. To Joy it seemed as if the inspector was openly fishing for information, and for one brief moment she hesitated. Should she take him into her confidence and tell him all? She was strongly tempted to do so, but in the end decided against it. Yes, she said, rising from her chair, he is a lawyer, and as Corporal Bracknell's cousin has been killed in England, it is possible that legal business has brought him here. I am greatly obliged to you, Inspector Graham, she paused, and then added, I have a little request to make. If you receive any news of Corporal Bracknell, will you send it to me at North Star? Yes, answered the inspector, but I am afraid you will be some time in receiving it, he smiled. As you know, it is something more than a crow's flight from here to your home. 
I was thinking of a special courier, said Joy quickly. There will be men to be found, and the expense is nothing to me. Very well, answered the inspector. I will see that you get whatever news reaches us at the earliest moment. We of the force are too much indebted to your late father and yourself to refuse a trifling request of that kind. There is nothing else that I can do for you, Miss Gargrave? Again Joy hesitated. Should she tell him what she thought was the real object of Adrian Rayner's journey? Sitting there in the quiet room, she suddenly felt that her suspicions would sound ridiculous if put into words. After all, she had so very little to go upon. Thank you. There's nothing. A moment later, Inspector Graham stood at his window, watching her cross the snow. He smiled a little to himself. Hmm, he muttered. If Bracknell is still alive, he is in the way of being a lucky fellow. Ten minutes later, Joy found Miss Lafarge in their room at the hotel. Babette, she said, we shall have to hurry. Adrian Rayner is already here. He is four days ahead of us. We must leave Regina within an hour. Yes, answered her foster sister. As Mr. Rayner is evidently in a hurry, we must hurry also. Is there any news of Corporal Brack now? None, except that his sled has been found. Ah, that is bad, very bad. You must not think that, Babette, cried Joy a little wildly. We must search. I will not give up hope. I will find him. Her voice quivered and broke, and suddenly she buried her face in her hands. Miss Lafarge looked at her for a moment with eyes brimming with sympathy. Then she took a step forward and placed her hand on her foster sister's shoulder. Joy, my dear, what is the corporal to you? To me? Joy looked up with confusion in her bearing. How can he be anything to me? How can any man? Yet, if we do not find him, it will be very bitter. As bitter as death, answered Joy, hiding her face once more. Then we must certainly find him, answered Miss Lafarge gravely, and by way of start I will talk to the clerk about trains. She turned and passed from the room, leaving her foster sister in tears. After a little time, Joy looked up. An absent gaze came in her tear-stained eyes. If I only knew, she whispered to herself, if I only knew. End of chapter 14「Chapter Fifteen of the Lady of the North Star by Otwell Binns. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An Encounter at the Lodge. It was midday, and as they marched between the high banks on a hard trail, Joy Gargrave's heart grew light. Another hour, Babette, and we shall be home. Yes, was the reply, home. That is what North Star is to us and I wonder you ever left it, Joy. I was afraid, answered Joy. Dick Bracknell's letter startled me. He plainly meant to assert himself, and I was glad of Sir Joseph's summons to England, because it helped me to get away from the complications here. It does not matter much where one goes, answered Babette philosophically. One carries one's real complications with her. Here or there, what matters? The heart is ever the same. Yes, that is true, answered Joy, thinking of the complications of her own life. We are the victims of our emotions quite as much as of circumstances. Of our inexperience more than our emotions, I should say, answered Babette. Of our inexperience and the ruthlessness of those who are prepared to take advantage of them. But here, better than in most places, we can live our own life, untrammeled and, for the most part, free from the worser cares. This lodge of ours is like a sanctuary in the wilderness, and the serenity, the woods, the snow, and the silences have their own healing for the troubles of life. Yes, but there is something to be said for companionship with one's own kind. I notice we are always a little excited when we have callers at the lodge. We... A rifle shot cracked in on her words, and before either of them could speak again, 
a moose broke suddenly from the woods and plunged down the steep bank not five hundred yards ahead of them. The wolf dogs in the sleds gave tongue and notwithstanding the burden behind them leaped forward. Joy laughed gaily. That's an end of philosophic reflection. The moose is hit. I wonder who. A man emerged from the woods, dropped on one knee, and sighted the wide-horned beast. Then his shot rang, and the moose toppled over in the snow. The hunter stood up and caught sight of the oncoming party. He scrutinized it carefully for a moment, and then waved his hand. "'It is George,' cried Babette, naming an Indian servant. "'See, he recognizes us.' The hunter descended the bank, and instead of going to inspect his kill, waited for them to come up. And as they did so, a smile crumpled his grave, copper-colored face. "'How,' he said, "'very glad to see you, Miss Joy and Miss Babette. "'My words are not as my heart, "'for my tongue is not easy of speech. "'But I am glad to behold you, glad, "'as if your coming were the breath "'of the south spring wind upon the cheek.' "'Joy laughed with pleasure. "'No more glad than we are, George, "'and you must not belittle that tongue of yours. "'If you only knew it, you talk poetry.' But tell me, how are things at the lodge? All right, I hope. And Annette and the papoose, they are well? They are well, answered the Indian, but we dwell not alone. With us are Rainer and two men of the Quick Pack tribe. They are bad men. Rainer, as she echoed the name, Joy's eyes flashed fire. Yes, with two bad men of the Quick Pack tribe. When did they arrive? asked Joy quickly. At nightfall five days ago, they were very weary and having followed the trail hard and long. Rayner brought word from you that he stay to look for some man, but he brought no word of your coming. No, I dare say not, answered Joy sharply. He would not expect us so soon. We have pushed the trail hard. What has Mr. Rayner been doing since he arrived, George? The first day he rest and smoke and ask many questions. Questions? About what? He asked if Nanette or I have beheld two men, one of whom is Corporal Bracknell, who took the northward trail when you went southward. He asked if we had seen him since that time, and I answered no, for it is the truth. And Rayner, he smiled to himself, as is the way of a man with a hidden thought. And the second man, of whom he asked? I know him not, answered the Indian, neither him nor the name of Dick, which he bore. Dick? Joy swung round to her companion. You hear, Babette? He asks after Dick, whose body, as he told me, he had thrust into an ice hole. I thought when he told me that he lied, and now I know. She turned to the Indian again, and the other days? The other days, answered the Indian gravely, he drink much brandy and a little coffee, and the two bad men, they go on a journey and return yesterday. They bring news, I think, for at dawn tomorrow they depart with Rayner. No, not tomorrow, cried Joy, but this very day. That will be as you desire, mistress, when we return. Where are they going, do you know, George? They take the northward trail. Rayner, tell me that when he have drunk much brandy. From North Star to North Star we go, he say. You old graven image, and when we come back the girl shall be ours. I do not understand such words, for there is no girl there. But such are the words that Rayner speak. Joy looked at Babette. He knows something, she said. Yes, answered her foster sister. But there is one thing he does not know, and that is a woman's heart. He surely cannot hope. I do not know what he may hope. I know what I shall do. My cousin Adrian is intolerable in his pretensions. What will you do, Joy? I begin to fancy that away from the restraints of civilization, Adrian Rayner is possibly a dangerous man, and we are north of fifty-three. I do not care, I'm not afraid. There is, as you once hinted, the law of the wilderness, and at least I will be mistress in my own house. She turned to her servant. We will leave you one of the sleds, George. You will then be able to bring some of the meat home. I will talk with you again when you arrive. She gave orders for one team to push on and one to remain. Then, as she and her sister recommenced their march, 
she spoke again. I wonder why Adrian Rayner has lingered so long at North Star. He has evidently been using the lodge as his headquarters while he made the necessary inquiries. Also, there is another possibility, answered Babette. And what is that? I have a thought that he may be desirous of assuring himself that you have arrived here. It is only a possibility, but it is there. I do not see why. Why do you suppose he wishes to marry you? asked Babette quickly. Because he loved you? Possibly. But you are a rich woman, and I think that may have more to do with the question than you have yet thought. It may have more to do with his journey here than anything else. Have you made a will, Joy? No, answered Joy quickly. I've never thought of it. My uncle never suggested it to me. That is not surprising, was the answer. After Dick Bracknell, your uncle is your next of kin. He and your cousin are your only blood relatives. Without a will, your marriage being unknown, your estate would fall to them if you were to die. Joy's face showed a dawning horror. Oh, but my uncle? Your uncle is human, Joy, and what is more, he has his difficulties. While we were at Claridge's, I overheard two men talking. I said nothing to you at the time, regarding it as mere gossip. But they were discussing Sir Joseph, and one of them said that he had gathered some confounded bad eggs during the last year or two, and that he must be very rich to stand it. Supposing he is not very rich, supposing the bad eggs are more than he can stand, than your money. But I cannot think that of my uncle, Babette. It is monstrous. Of your uncle, no, perhaps not. But your cousin is another matter. Let us suppose that he knows of Sir Joseph's losses. We know he is not scrupulous. Knowing of your marriage to Dick Bracknell, he paid you attention. He asked you to marry him. He even stooped the threats, as you told me. Why? Because he wanted to be able to control your fortune, to keep the money, some of which was badly needed. You may shake your head, Joy, but that is at least a possibility, and that is why I suggest that it is possible that Adrian Rayner may be desirous of assuring himself of your arrival here. You are beginning to know him. Do you think that after his attempt to lure you into a bigamous marriage, and after his threats, that he will be at all chary of using any means that circumstances may offer of putting him in possession of your fortune? I do not and he has been drinking, if what George says is true, and drink makes a tempted man dangerous. You must be careful, Joy, even diplomatic if necessary. I shall order him to leave North Star the moment we arrive there, answered Joy stubbornly, if there is a shadow of truth in your surmises. There is all the more reason why I should do so. You will do as you please, Joy, replied her foster sister, breaking into a smile, and at any rate, we have the big battalions on our side. With the drivers and George and George's son Jim, we shall be able to enforce your will. And I shall do so, answered Joy. Here I am strong enough to disregard his threats. As it happened, the first person they encountered, when they left the river trail and swung into the clearing which led to the lodge, was Adrian Rayner. He was walking towards the river with a rifle in the crook of his arm and as he saw them swinging towards him, he halted suddenly and remained quite still, until Joy reached him. The look on his face betrayed his surprise, and to Joy it was clear that he had not expected to encounter her before his departure from the lodge. He stood there a little nonplussed, and it was Joy who spoke first. "'You have not wasted time, Cousin Adrian,' she said, and there was an unmistakable edge to her tones. No, he answered with an awkward laugh. I promised you I would find the man who was in the wood when you shot your hus. No, she interrupted sharply. Not when I did, but when you shot my husband. There was accusation in her eyes, her voice, and Rayner visibly quailed before it. Then he cried, What confounded nonsense is this? It is not nonsense, she answered. It is at least the possibility. You were in the woods that night and you had a rifle with you. There were two shots, and one of them hit Dick Bracknell. One of those shots came from my rifle. But from whose rifle did the second come? Yours, I say. 
Mine, he cried harshly, you must be mad. You cannot have thought over what you are saying. No, she countered, I am not mad, and I am quite sane, and I have thought a great deal over the matter. But why should I shoot Dick Bracknell, masquerading as Kuna Dick? He was not my husband. No, replied Joy coolly, but he was mine, and you had somehow become aware of the fact. If I am not mistaken, you yourself aspired to marry me. Men are sometimes smitten with madness, he interposed, sneeringly, but there is another possibility that I can suggest to you, of which you do not seem to have thought. That precious corporal who was here, he had a gun. Also, I fancy that he would find the death of Dick Bracknell no heart-breaking business, as it would bring him within a step of the succession to Harrow Fell. And as Jeff Bracknell is now dead, it puts him absolutely on the doorstep. Have you thought of that? There's no need that I should, answered Joy promptly. Roger Bracknell had no knowledge that the man whom he knew as Kuna Dick was his cousin, until he picked up a note which Dick had written to me, which was some time after the firing had taken place. I know that, and your suggestion is merely preposterous. You think so, he laughed. I wonder why. Something in his tones brought the blood flaming to Joy Gargray's face. Her eyes flashed indignantly. Rayner laughed again brutally. Not that there is any need for wonder, he said maliciously. You seem to be in great vogue with the Bracknells. It must be a family weakness for... How dare you! She took a step forward and suddenly raised the dog whip in her hand. Rayner backed quickly and instinctively raised his hand. But the long lash smote him on the face, and he gave vent to a savage oath. You, Virago, would you? He had lost complete control of himself, and what would have happened is only to be conjectured. But at that moment the Indian George stepped quietly from behind some tall bushes. He still carried his rifle, and though there was an impassive look on his brown face, his eyes were blazing. The white man saw him, and as he met those eyes, the wrath in him was checked. The Indian spoke no word, but very deliberately opened the breech of his rifle, as if to assure himself that it was loaded. Then he closed it and looked at Rayner again. And at that second look, the white man shivered. For he saw in it something threatening and ominous, which unsealed the spring of fear within him. Joy was the first to speak. George, she said, addressing her henchman, Mr. Rayner takes the trail in an hour. Anything he needs for his journey he is to have, but he goes within the hour, and never again is he to visit North Star. Do you understand? The Indian nodded his head in grave assent, and without another look at Adrian Rayner, Joy turned and went up the road towards the house. End of chapter 15《Of the Lady of the North Star》by Otwell Binns. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Corporal Hears News. During the weeks of his convalescence in Chief Louis' smoking teepee, Roger Bracknell spent much of his time in reflecting on the news which the Chief had given him. Reviewing the story calmly and dispassionately, he could find nothing to weaken the conclusion which the half-breed himself had reached. The dynamite and the winter thunder, with the description of the broken trail and the strange conduct of the unknown man in deliberately overrunning Rolf Gargrave's camp, were almost conclusive evidence. Someone had planned that Rolf Gargrave should die, and his death had been as surely as murder as if the man who had planned it had taken a rifle with which to do the deed. Who was the man? And often as he asked himself this question, the corporal found his thoughts reverting to his cousin. Had Dick Bracknell, having married Rolf Galgrave's daughter, deliberately planned the murder of the millionaire? His heart revolted at the thought, but he could not escape from it. Dick had been hard-pressed. He was already a fugitive from justice when he had arrived in the North, and, so far as the corporal knew, that arrival had been a secret one. 
he would be quite unknown, even to Rolf Gargrave. No one would suspect him, and the plan he had chosen was itself so novel that, but for the Indians noticing his absence from the camp and carrying the sticks of dynamite back to Chief Louis, it must have escaped detection. The more the corporal thought of it, the more black seemed the case against his cousin. Rolf Gargrave was a clever man and powerful, and he had had his own plans for his daughter. Dick Bracknell must have known that when he heard how Joy had been trapped into marriage, and he would be very wrathful, and calculating on the father's intervention, he must have decided to get rid of him, in the hope of sooner or later trading upon Joy's inexperience of the world. One day, while he was reflecting on the problem, unable to touch certainty anywhere, a thought occurred to him, and when Chief Louis entered the teepee, he promptly asked the question. Louis, when was it that the stranger called at your camp for guides to help him find Rolf Gargrave? I mean, what time of the year was it? The chief considered for a moment, then he answered gravely. It was two moons before the ice break up. You are sure? asked the corporal. Certain. That would be March or a little later, said the corporal, thoughtfully. And Dick fled from England about Christmas. If he came straight through, he might do it comfortably. Dick, who is that? asked the chief quickly. He is the one man I know who may have been interested in Rolf Gargrave's death. You may have heard of him. He is known in the North as Kuna Dick. I have not seen him unless he was a stranger man who come to my camp that day, but of him I have heard. He is bad mans. He wants shooting. He sell whiskey, much whiskey, to the porcupine sticks, and they fight till seven be dead in the snow. Also he take their catch of fur for the whiskey, and when the winter it comes they freeze and the babies die. Yes, of him I have heard, and he is very bad mans. So is the mans that come to my lodges that day and that blow up the trail for Rolf Gargrave, so that he die. I have not said so yet, answered the corporal thoughtfully, but I am afraid there can be little question of it. Some day when I meet him, I shall put the question to him plainly and learn the truth. You know this man, Kuna Dick? Yes, he's my cousin. As he received the information, the half-breed flashed a quick glance of sympathy. Le Diabla, he said, that is strange, but so it does befall. One pup of the litter is a good dog, and he grows to the collar work naturally. But another he is bad. He snarl like the wolf. He is a thief, and he will not do the work. So it is with the sled dogs and with men. It is passing strange, but I have often beheld it, and it is so. The corporal nodded his assent. He had often wondered at the crooked strain which had sent his cousin on wild courses to dishonor, but could find no consolation in the thought that, given certain circumstances, the way of dishonor was almost inevitable. He rose from the couch of skins, and moving stiffly towards the fire, thrust in a spruce twig, and with it lit his pipe. Then he turned to the chief. "'I wonder how soon I shall be able to take the trail, Louis.' The half-breed shook his head. Not yet. The leg that have been broken, it is not good for the snowshoe work. No, it ain't like Le Diable. You must wait, wait till the ice breaks up. Then you go down the river in a canoe. That will be the easy way, yes. A mutinous look came on Roger Bracknell's face. Having so long lived an active life, he was growing tired of the monotony of the encampment and as he felt the strength returning to his leg, was more and more inclined to make the attempt to reach civilization as represented by the police post. There was news to send to Joy Gargrave, news that might profoundly affect her life, and it was desirable that she should receive it at the earliest possible moment. I do not think that I shall wait until then, Louis. They will give me up for lost at the post, and besides, I have news for a certain person. Is the news good? interrupted the chief. For a moment, the corporal did not reply. Was the news he had to send to Joy Gargrave good? In one way, yes. It would suffice 
to remove any lingering doubts as to the effect of the shot that she had fired when she had gone to meet Dick Bracknell in the wood. He would be able to assure her, on the evidence of Dick himself, that she was not responsible for the mischief that had been done. That assurance, as he knew, would mean the lifting of a weight of apprehension from Joy's heart. In another way, however, the news was bad. Dick Bracknell was still alive, and that meant that she was still bound to him, and that on the first favorable opportunity he might assert himself. His mind was still balancing the good and evil of the case when Louis, who had been watching his face, spoke again. There is no need to speak the news it is not good. Therefore, there is not any cause for haste. Ill news does not grow worse for keeping, and the trail it is bad these days, for there is much snow. Nevertheless, I shall make the endeavor, Louis. I will borrow a man and a dog team and meat from you, and in one week I will take the trail. If I find it too much for me, I can return. The chief nodded. As you please, the dogs are yours, also the meat and the man's, though the hunters are from the camp just now. But if you must go, you must, and it is Le Diable in the race that drives you forth, Corporal. The devil in the race, laughed Bracknell. I do not understand, Louis. What do you mean? I mean the unrest that dwells in the men of your tribe. It drives them forth, for good or ill, to the conquest of the lands. It makes them seek the stick which runs through the earth. The pole, you mean, Louis? The pole, yes. And when we got, what good? It makes them that they cannot sit by the fires and warm teepees, but must go hunt the bald-faced bear, or dig the frozen earth for gold that somewhere white squaw may fling it from the window. Yes, laughed the corporal, you put the truth rather brutally. We are rather given that way. But it isn't the devil, Louis. It is the genius and instinct of our race for conquest that drives us. That and the dream of the home woman, I suppose. Chief Louis nodded. We, oui, maybe. And you have the dream, corporal? Corporal Bracknell stopped his perambulation of the hut and stared at his companion. Now how the dickens do you know that, Louis? I have seen it in your eyes. You speak of Rolf Gargrave, and twice only you have speak of Gargrave's daughter. But there were dreams in the eyes, then, and a soft note in the voice, and I know that she is what you call the home woman. We, oui. I know that is so. The corporal's face flushed, and he did not deny it. For one moment as he stood there he had a vision of Joy Gargrave, young and beautiful, and a fit mate for any man, and in that moment there were dreams in his eyes. Three seconds later realities asserted themselves, and the soft light died from his eyes. He gave a little bitter laugh, and without speaking resumed his perambulations. Chief Louis watched him for a moment, then he said tentatively, "'There be difficulties ahead, Corporal.' "'Yes,' nodded Bracknell, "'grave difficulties. What would you do, Louis, if you wanted a maid to wife?' "'I should offer a large price, blankets, guns, tobacco.' Roger Bracknell laughed at the notion of offering a large price for Joy Gargrave, and then mooted the real difficulty. "'But if it was not a matter of price, Louis, rather of another man, what then? Then I would fight him. Always maidens are caught with strength. They love a man. That is the law of life and of mating. The strong wolf in the pack he have the pick, and the strong moose he have herd, and the strong man he take the maid. I have looked on the world, and so it is. Yes, love, like all things else, is the spoil of the strong." Bracknell did not reply for a moment. In that hour, the law of the primal wilds appealed to him strongly, but he knew that it was not the way for him. Yes, he said, it is the law of the wilds, but not of my race. I carry a law that is the law of man, and he who kills, whether for love or hate, dies therefore. The thing is impossible. Chief Louis grunted disapprobation. The law of the wild is better. For that reason, 
I dwell in the lodges of my mother's people, where the strong rule. He knocked the ashes from his pipe, and without adding more, passed out of the teepee. Roger Bracknell still continued his perambulations, exercising his injured leg, and as he walked his mind was busy with what he felt was to become the problem of his life. He loved Joy Gargrave. He confessed it frankly to himself. He had loved her since that day when in the woods at North Star she had offered him her hand as a token that she counted him among her friends. But what good was it? The whole thing was so hopeless so long as Dick Bracknell lived, and if he died, would the outlook be any the less hopeless? He could not tell, but he was afraid not, for friendship was not love, and Joy Gargrave, as he was sure, was not a woman to give her affection easily. As he thought, despair gripped him, and the teepee's skin wall seemed too narrow a prison house. He threw on his fur coat and mittens and went outside. Driven by his thoughts, he left the encampment and, walking stiffly, moved down the river trail. He had walked perhaps a mile and a half when, out of the woods, broke a couple of laden sledges and two men of the tribe. They were from the hunters, and as they passed, they saluted him gravely, according to the manner of their race. How! How! He responded in kind and continued to walk on. He had proceeded but a little way, however, when a thought occurred to him. These men had been away on the main river. They might have news of the outer world. Instantly, as the thought came to him, he turned in his tracks and began to return to the encampment. When he reached there, the two hunters were not to be seen. But when he entered his own teepee, he found Chief Louis sitting by the fire, smoking. There was an impassive look on his face, but in his eyes was a light that could not be hidden, and the white man knew that the chief was excited. The corporal did not remark upon the fact, however, but deliberately filled his pipe, and seating himself, smoked on as if he had noticed nothing. After a little time, Louise spoke. The hunters, they have sent meat, much meat. Yes, answered Bracknell. I met two of the men of the tribe just now. There is meat for a potlatch, feast, but that is not the way of my people. We are not as the wolves which eat all, even the bones, and then run hungry until a new kill is made. There is much wisdom in such prudence, answered Bracknell, wondering when the half-breed would unfold his news. It is the way of the white man's, and it is the way of the wise. Therefore, do we eat, and leave meat that we may eat again? The corporal nodded, but said nothing, and after a pause, Chief Louis spoke again. Of the two men you met, one was Cebu. Ah, Cebu, who with Pasek went as a guide with a stranger who wished to overtake Rolf Gargrave? We, oui, Cebu, who went with a stranger man's, who blow the bottom out of the trail that Rolf Gargrave die. Roger Bracknell waited. He felt that he was on the verge of some revelation, but he concealed his impatience and maintained an unperturbed demeanor, knowing that such would commend him to his host. The half-breed puffed stolidly at his pipe for a full minute, then he spoke again. Cebu brings not meat alone, he brings news. News? We, oui, of the strange man who dynamites the trail. Is that so? That is news which Cebu bring to me. He say that six days ago, the strange man comes to the hunting camp to buy meat. He have with him fine dogs and two bad Indians. He offers for meat one good rifle and many cartridges, and Cebu sell him meat. Also, he know him for the stranger man, but the stranger, he does not know Cebu, whose face last winter was mauled by a bald-faced grizzly to whom he did not give the trail. The stranger man, he camped with the hunters for the night, and the two Indians they smoke with Cebu and ask questions, many questions. Yes, said Bracknell, as the chief paused, what about? He asked about a white man of the name of Kuna Dick. Great Scott! And they ask if anything be known of another white man's, a policeman who is lost, 
and Cebu, whose tongue is a silent one, asked the name of the policeman's. Did he get it? asked the corporal quickly. We. Oui. The name was Corporal Bracknell, which is you. By Jove, yes, but who? The half-breed checked him by raising his hand, and continued. Cebu have in mind that the trail was blown up for Rolf Gargrave, and he is cautious. He told of your sled, which was found, and of the dead wolves, but he say nothing that we find you, and that you are with me, and presently the two bad Indians go back to the stranger man's, who is in a teepee which Cebu has set for him. Cebu he follow, and he lie in the snow outside of the teepee, and with his knife he cut a hole in the teepee, that he may see and hear. The strange man, he is by the fire, and Cebu sees the face of him, while his men talk. When they tell of the sled and the dead wolves, the white man's he smile, as a man well pleased, and that is everything except that next morning he go north with the meat he have bartered for. Such is the tale of Cebu. What think you, Corporal? Think? It is no time for thinking. It is time for action. There's some infernal work afoot, and I start on that man's trail tomorrow. Whatever his game may be now, and it is a mystery that passes my comprehension, he's the murderer of Rolf Gargrave, and I'll get him if I follow him to the pole. But the story puzzles me. Those Indians asked about Kuna Dick. Why should they do that? The chief shook his head. That I cannot tell. It's odd, very odd. Kuna Dick is the one man who may reasonably be suspected of a motive for getting rid of Rolf Gargrave. That I know, but... He broke off as a thought occurred to him, and then remarked thoughtfully, The question may have been a mere bluff of Dick's. He may, after all, have recognized Cebu, and set his men to ask the question in order to discover whether your man had any knowledge of his name. Yes, that may be it. But I will find him, and I will learn the truth. Louis, can I have a team in stores for the morning, and Cebu also? He knows the man, and I do not. Of course the service will be paid for from Regina. The chief nodded his head. The dogs are yours, with the stores, also, Cebu goes with you. But you will find the trail hard, for that leg, he is not yet strong. It will grow stronger every day, and with Cebu to pack the trail, I shall do well. I start at dawn in the morning. Then, said Louis, rising, I will go, and the team select for you. The dogs shall be of the best. He went out, leaving Roger Brack now in a whirl of conflicting thoughts. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of the Lady of the North Star by Otwell Binns. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Lonely Cabin. Corporal Bracknell and Cebu had left the hunting camp of the tribe two days, and were following the trail of the white man and the two Indians who had visited more than a week before. The trail, though it was old, was well defined, for there had been no fall of snow in the interval, and the frozen surface of the wilderness kept the trail fresh, and made it easy to follow. It was evident to both of them that their quarry traveled fast, for the distances between the camping places were greater than was usual, and it was clear that those whom they followed had some need for haste. What it could be the corporal could only guess, and guessing under the circumstances was not a very profitable occupation. And there were other signs which gave room for speculation. Now and again the party ahead of them had halted for a little time, and two of the men had left the dogs and the sled, as their tracks showed. These halting places, as the corporal was quick to observe, always occurred when some small stream fell into the main river, or when some accessible gully or creek opened from the banks. "'What do you make of it, Sabu?' he asked, when they had reached the fifth halting place of this sort. The Indian who had followed the tracks of two of the gullies to the point where they reversed glanced at those which now lay before them. Then he waved a mittened hand. 
These men be looking for something. Or someone, commented the corporal thoughtfully. The Indian gave a grave inclination of his head. It is not good to follow every trail, he said in his own tongue. Sometimes, perhaps, we shall find a trail that does not return on itself. Then we know they find what they seek and we follow. Yes, answered the corporal. That is the best way, I think. We will push on and not waste time on these excursions. They pressed forward and passed two more of these deviations from the main track without troubling to follow them. Just before daylight faded, when they were hugging the bank, looking for a suitable camping place, the Indian called the corporal's attention to a small creek entrance to which was masked by low-bowed spruce trees. Yes, said the corporal, that should do. Those banks and trees should break the wind. They turned the dogs toward it, and negotiating a snow wreath which the wind was piling up, they entered the sheltering creek. Sabu was leading, packing the trail, and the corporal, clinging to the gee-pole of the sled, saw him come to a most unexpected halt. Bracknell moved forward. What is the matter, Sabu? The Indian did not speak, but pointed silently at the snow, and looking down, the corporal saw the unmistakable trail of snowshoes. The tracks were quite fresh, and they were so unexpected that Bracknell was himself astonished. He stared at them, as Crusoe must have stared when he found the footprints on the shore of his island, who had left that tell-tale trail. Perhaps a wandering Indian, maybe some solitary prospector caught by winter, or possibly the man whom he was seeking, the murderer of Rolf Gargrave. His heart beat quickly at the thought, and, still staring at the trail, which came down the bank of the creek and then turned away from the river, he considered the matter carefully and then gave instructions. Follow it, Sabu, and find out where it goes and who made it. I will pitch camp and wait here for you. The Indian nodded gravely and departed, and Bracknell busied himself with pitching camp. He had already lit the fire and fed the dogs, and was busy with the beans and bacon when Sabu returned. Well, asked the corporal expectantly, did you find him? Yes, was the reply. There is one Indian and one white man. They are in a cabin at the head of the creek. Bracknell was conscious of a sudden excitement. Did you see the white man, is it? Sabu shook his head. I saw him, but it is not the man we follow, and he is very sick with a coughing sickness. The corporal's excitement died as quickly as it had risen. Did you speak with him, Sabu? No, replied the Indian. There was no need. I saw his face as he came to the cabin door. It is not the man. Corporal Bracknell bent over the fire. He was disappointed, but he did not show it. He turned the bacon in the pan, then he looked up. We will have supper first, then I will walk up the creek as far as the cabin, and have a talk with this white man. He may know something of the man we follow. Sabu made no reply, and when the meal was ready, they ate it in silence, and smoked while they drank the coffee. Then Bracknell arose. I go now, Sabu. I shall return before sleeping time. The Indian offered no objection to this, and knocking the ashes from his pipe, the policeman left the camp. Even in the darkness he had no difficulty in following the trail up the creek, and presently the smell of burning wood informed him that he was in the neighborhood of the cabin. He looked round carefully and descried it in the shadow of the trees on the right bank and began to ascend towards it. When he reached it, there was no clamor of dogs such as might have been expected had there been a team there, and as he rapped upon the door, he reflected that his conjecture about the gold prospector overtaken by winter was probably the correct one. The door was flung open, and a tall man, whose face he could not discern, stood revealed. Inside, in front of a makeshift stove, was another man, who was taken suddenly by a paroxysm of coughing. For half a minute the corporal stood there, and the man at the door did not move or speak. But at the end of that time, between two spasms of coughing, the other man cried querulously, Oh, come in and shut that confounded door. The man at the door moved aside, and as Bracknell entered, he closed the door behind him and stood with his back to it, 
staring at the newcomer with eyes that had in them a savage gleam of hate. The man by the fire was still coughing, and at the end of some three minutes, as the cough left him, he sat there gasping and wheezing and utterly exhausted. Roger Bracknell watched him with compassionate eyes. As he recognized, the man was in sore straits, and that cough probably meant that the coming of the spring was for him the coming of death. As his breath came back, the sick man half turned. "'Sit down, Cat. The remark was broken off halfway, and the man started from his seat. "'Great, Christopher, a Daniel come to judgment. How do you do, Cousin Roger?' As the voice quivering with excitement rang through the cabin, a startled look came on Roger Bracknell's face, and he bent forward and stared at the wasted features of the unkept man before him. The other laughed harshly. "'Oh, you didn't stare so hard, Roger. It is I, right enough.' It was Dick Bracknell, and as the corporal realized the fact, the compassion he had felt for a stranger was trebled when he found that the sick man was of his own blood. For a moment he did not reply, but with a shocked look on his face, gazed at the ravaged features before him. The coughing sickness, which Cebu had mentioned, had plainly gripped Dick Bracknell, and marked him for death. Some of his teeth were gone, and the color of his gums appeared like yellow ochre in the firelight. As he noted these signs of scurvy, the corporal was moved to speak his pity. "'Dick, old man, I am mortal sorry.' "'Then keep your infernal pity for yourself,' cried the other savagely. "'You'll need it all in a minute, for Joe has a drop on you, you murderer.' The corporal started and swung around. The Indian Joe was standing with his back to the door, and the glow of the fire was reflected from the pistol in his hand. He noted the fact quite calmly and turned to his cousin again. Murderer, he said slowly, I do not understand. What do you mean? No, snarled his cousin. Well, look at me. Would you say that I was a good case for a life insurance society? The corporal looked at him and out of pity was silent. "'Oh, you needn't be so particular,' continued the other sneeringly. "'I've seen other fellows whose lungs have been chilled, "'and I know I am booked unless I can get to a sanatorium in double quick time. "'And I know you have a soft heart, "'but you should have let it speak sooner before you put this upon me.' "'Before I put? I do not know what you mean.' "'No, but you know that you poisoned the dog food that we took from you, don't you? "'And you can guess.' "'Good God!' ejaculated the corporal, and the astonishment in his face and voice did more than any protest could have done to convince his cousin that the charges were groundless. "'You didn't know?' "'No, I see you didn't,' cried the sick man. "'Of course I didn't,' replied the policeman quickly. "'The dogs you left me died of poison at my first camp, after they had been fed. I blamed your man, because you had told me that he was reluctant to let me go.' Now it seems that I was wrong, as you are wrong. Tell me what happened. I will, said his cousin, sit down. As the corporal seated himself on a log, Dick Bracknell turned to the Indian. You can put down that pistol for the present, Joe. There's a mystery to be cleared up before there's any shooting to be done. Put it down, I tell you. The Indian obeyed reluctantly, but still stood against the door, and Dick Bracknell explained. Joe there has it saved up against you. He was sure that you had deliberately poisoned the dog food, so that we should get stranded, and you, with a new outfit, would be able to find us at your leisure. I couldn't believe it of you at first. It was such a low-down game, and I would have sworn that nobody but a Siwash half-breed would have played it. But the logic of facts seemed convincing, and I'd come to believe it. Tell me what happened. That's easy enough. When I parted from you, I had an idea of working across to the bearing, where I had been off the beat of your confounded patrols. We traveled a week and made a good pace. Then one night, Joe fed the dogs with that salmon row we took off your sled. They were all dead within two hours, and there we were, stranded in the shadow of the Arctic Circle, and nearly a thousand miles from civilization. The sick man broke off, shaken by a fit of coughing, and then, 
as the spasm passed and his breath returned, he said meditatively, If you'd walked into our camp, then we'd have fed you with that row, and watched you twist as those dogs were twisted. For Joe looked at the food and found strychnine, which he'd used when he was trapping for the HBC. Lucky thing for you that you didn't. Did you say your dogs died of the same thing? Yes, answered the corporal slowly, and now I'm wondering who was responsible. Someone who is getting at you and not at us, answered Dick Bracknell quickly, for he couldn't have known that we should collar the food. Had you been using the same stuff all along? No, the word dropped from the corporal reluctantly. No, I had laid in a new stock at North Star. Then it was there the thing was done, replied the sick man with conviction. The question is, who did it? Joy wouldn't even dream of such a thing. That at any rate is quite certain, answered the corporal with conviction. But somebody did it. Somebody who owed you one and meant to get rid of you. That's shown by the fact that your dogs did all right on the food at the beginning. That which you used first wasn't tampered with, or the dogs would have died at the first camp you made. But they didn't, for you camped with us, and I remember that more than once, while we were waiting for my convalescence, you fed your dogs with a row. That is positive proof that the top portion of the dog food was all right. It was only lower down that it had been tampered with. But why? It's as plain as the barn door. You were meant to get well away on the trail, and one night you would unknowingly feed the dogs with poisoned roe. They would die, and unless you had wonderful luck, you would die too, long before you got back to civilization. That is the amiable plan that somebody thought out for you. And as things turned out, he nearly bagged me and Joe instead of you. But he almost got me too, said the corporal thoughtfully, and gave his cousin a brief account of his adventures. You are lucky, commented the sick man. A broken leg can be spliced, but who's going to splice a set of frozen lungs? His face grew suddenly convulsed with passion, and he broke into terrible oaths. If I had the murderer here, but who was he anyway? There's only one man of whom I can think, and before I tell you his name, there are two questions I should like to ask. Fire them off. The first is this. Do you know anything of Rolf Gargrave's death? I know that the bottom dropped out of the trail, and that he was drowned, nothing more. What's that got to do with it anyway? The corporal looked at his cousin. The haggard face was clear of guilt and in that moment he knew that his earliest suspicions, when Chief Louis had told him the story of Rolf Gargrave's death, had been utterly wrong. Whatever crimes Dick Bracknell had to his account, this was not one of them. I'll explain why I asked you in a moment, he answered. There is the second question yet, and it is this. Did you ever inform anyone of your marriage with Joy? Yes, one man. When I heard that Rolf Gargrave was dead, I wrote to England and informed his legal adviser, Sir Joseph Rayner, that Joy and I were husband and wife. I never had any answer to the le— But what's the matter, man? You look as if you had seen a ghost. What is it? There was a look of startled amazement on the corporal's face. He was staring at his cousin, as if what the latter had said was a revelation to him, and indeed it was. A dark suspicion had leaped into his mind a suspicion that seemed almost incredible, but which persisted and would not be thrust aside. If Sir Joseph Rayner knew, then in all probability his son also knew, and yet having that knowledge he had suggested that the relation between himself and Joy was such as justified his confessed aspiration of making her his wife. Had he been responsible for the second shot at North Star, or— Dick Bracknell's voice broke in again querulously. "'What's got you, Roger? Spit it out.' "'I can't at present,' replied the corporal slowly. "'You've given me news that I must think over before I talk. But there is one thing that I can tell you, and that is that Ralph Gargrave did not die by a mere accident. The trail he was following was sound enough, but the ice was blown up by dynamite. It froze over again in the night, and as I gather, there was a little snow and he went on the thin ice without suspicion, and went through. That's the story as I've recently heard it. 
and I'm on the trail of the man who plotted the infernal thing now. The sick man pursed his lips to whistle, but no sound came from them. Then he remarked, with a little laugh of bitterness, So that's why you asked if I knew anything of my father-in-law's death, is it? It is just a suspicion that occurred to me, explained the corporal apologetically. When I heard the story, I wondered who would benefit by Gargrave's death. And as you had just married Joy, and had fled here from England, it was a natural suspicion. I must have got pretty low down for it to be natural to suspect me of an infernal crime of that sort, was the other's bitter comment. But who do you suspect now? I don't know. As I told you, I'm after the man. The trail's a week old, but I'll find him even if I follow him to the rim of the polar sea. I hope to heaven you get him, and then I'll swing at Regina for that job. I wonder if the same man had anything to do with poisoning the dog food. I'm wondering that also, replied the corporal thoughtfully. Any idea of the fellow? Just a suspicion, nothing more. Not enough to presume upon, yet. He must have a mind that is diabolic. So it would seem, replied the corporal, and after a little time his cousin spoke again. Many a time, while I have sat here wheezing and coughing, I have cursed you from my heart. But now I could pray that you come up with that man, and make him pay for it all. If I were sure you'd get him, I could go cheerfully to my appointed place in the pit. I shall get him, answered the corporal, with conviction. The Indian who is with me was with him when he arranged for Gargrave's death, and if my suspicions have any bottom in them, then I know him myself. You push on in the morning, of course. Before daylight I shall come up with a man. Never fear. He's traveling fast, but he's looking for something or someone. The latter, I think, and... Who do you suppose he's looking for? Well, if he's the man I suspect, I shouldn't wonder if he were looking for you. For me? What in thunder for? To finish what he began that night when you were shot at North Star. Great Scott, do you mean that he was the man who? It seems to me to be more than likely. He is the man round whom all these mysteries seem to center. What is the blighter? asked the other quickly. That I must keep to myself for a little time. I may be mistaken, you know, but if I am not, you'll let me know. You'll give me the satisfaction of knowing that the fellow will pay for these lungs of mine, cried the sick man eagerly. Yes, answered the corporal pityingly. I will let you know. Half an hour later, as he left the cabin, his face wore a set look that boded ill for the man on whose trail he followed. End of chapter 17《Chapter Eighteen of the Lady of the North Star by Otwell Binns. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Adrian Rayner's Story. Joe, I thought I heard the yelping of dogs. Did you hear anything? The Indian shook his head, and Dick Bracknell sank back on his improvised couch of spruce with a sigh. Of course, he muttered, I'm dreaming. No, by Jove, I'm not. There it is again. Don't you hear it, Joe? This time the Indian nodded, going to the door of the cabin, looked down the creek. Three men and a dog sled were coming up the trail. He turned and informed Bracknell of the fact. A thoughtful frown came on the sick man's face. Who can they be? Not Roger, certainly, for it is but two days since he was here, and he had but one man with him, perhaps. Then, as a thought struck him, he broke off and cried excitedly, I say, Joe, does one of the men look at all like a prisoner? The Indian shook his head. That's a pity, commented his master. I had a wild hope that Roger might have overtaken the man. Anyway, we shall know who they are in a few minutes, and patience is a virtue that I've plenty of opportunity for practicing just now. Laboriously, he rose from his couch and seated himself near the fire. The effort brought on a fit of coughing, which was still shaking him, when a whipstock rapped upon the door. His servant opened it, and a white man entered, and stood for a moment watching Bracknell as he coughed and groaned. Then, suddenly, an alert look came in his face, and for one instant into his eyes 
there came a flicker of recognition. He waited until the paroxysm had passed. Then, in a voice that had in it a note of sympathy, he spoke. "'You seem in a bad way, friend.' The voice of a cultured man, as Bracknell instantly noted. And as he wiped his eyes, the sick man looked sharply at the newcomer. "'Yes,' he replied. "'And so would you be if you had your lungs frozen.' "'Is it as bad as that?' asked the other in a voice that was still sympathetic. "'It is, and worse. I've got scurvy, too. I suppose you haven't such a thing as a potato with you?' The stranger smiled. "'As it happens, I have. I never travel without in winter. Because, as you seem to know, a raw potato is better than lime juice for scurvy, and a sight handier to carry. I shall be happy to oblige you.' He went to the door of the cabin and called an order to the men outside. A few moments later an Indian entered, bringing with him seven or eight potatoes. Bracknell instantly seized one, and taking out a clasp knife, he began to cut thin slices of the tuber, and to eat regardless of everything but the one fact that here was salvation from one of the diseases which afflicted him. He chewed methodically without speaking, and Adrian Rayner, for he was the arrival, watched him with curious eyes. Reflecting on the irony of the situation, which made the heir of an ancient estate glad to eat raw potato, for though he himself remained incognito, he had already recognized Dick Bracknell. I'd go slow if I were you, he said warningly, as having finished one tuber, the sick man stretched his hand for another. You had better not overdo it. A little every day is better than a glut and, of course, my stock is limited. Dick Bracknell laughed weakly. You are right, of course, but if you knew what I suffer, you'd understand the impulse to stuff oneself. I'll go slow as you advise, and perhaps I shall quit one of these diseases at any rate, though the other will get rid of me as sure as a gun. You think so? asked Rayner, with an eager interest, which Bracknell failed to note. Sure of it? I've seen other men this way, and there was always a funeral at the end of it, though not always a burial service. Parsons are scarce up here. Have you been long in the country? asked Rayner carelessly. Bracknell looked at him sharply, as if suspicious of so simple a question, and then gave a short laugh. I've been here a year or two, and you? You're pretty new to the north, aren't you? Rayner laughed, a regular tenderfoot. I've been here before, but only for a short spell, and this time I'm straight from England. Is that so? asked Bracknell, and appraised the stranger anew. In the mining line, I suppose. Nothing half so profitable, answered Rayner smilingly. I am merely representing a legal firm, and I've come out on a rather curious mission, one with little profit in it, in fact, and with even a possibility of loss. "'That's poor business for a lawyer,' said Bracknell encouragingly. "'It is,' agreed Rayner, "'and it's not only that, "'but it is about the queerest business that I ever struck.' He turned and addressed a remark to one of his men, who had entered the cabin, and then resumed. "'It is quite a romance in high life, and very interesting. Would you like to hear the story?' "'I was always fond of romance,' answered Bracknell with a laugh. "'As up here... We've no penny dreadfuls. I shall be glad to have a slice of the real thing. Oh, it's real enough, answered Rayner, and it's interesting, because it has a rich and young and beautiful girl for the heroine. Romance always must have, commented Bracknell. Your story, I can see, is going on the penny plain and two penny colored line. Not quite. It has deviations and some original features. This girl's father was immensely rich, and while he remained in this country, looking after his mining properties, he sent his daughter to England to be educated. There she ran against the heir of an old Westmoreland family, and married him secretly. He broke off as his host rose unexpectedly to his feet. "'What is the matter?' he asked innocently. "'Are you not feeling well?' "'Just a spasm,' growled Bracknell. "'It will pass in a minute.' Get on with your tale. The other smiled a little to himself and resumed his narrative. As I was saying, 
she married this young gentleman secretly and immediately after the marriage separated from him for some reason and at the same time something else happened which compelled her husband to leave england and to reside abroad did you say something no it's only this confounded wheeze of mine about the same time the news reached england that the girl's father had died in an accident out here and as by the terms of his will the daughter was to reside for three years in the home he had built in the woods here she returned to the dominion without having said anything about the marriage to her uncle and guardian that well-known solicitor sir joseph rayner of whom you perhaps have heard yes i've heard of him go on man your story is very interesting fortunately sir joseph was not left in ignorance of the marriage for the girl's husband wrote and informed him of it sir joseph was astonished but he kept the news to himself because the husband though of good family had done something that was uh scarcely creditable he did not even inform the girl of the information which had reached him hoping that time would solve what appeared to be a difficult situation and hasn't it no sir time may solve many things but the policy of lazy fare which sometimes is a good one is not without its dangers this happens to be one of the cases where the dangers predominate and time has brought a new complication what is that asked bracknell sharply well the girl is thinking of marrying again god in heaven dick bracknell had staggered to his feet his eyes were burning and there was a ghastly pallor on his haggard face he glared at the narrator as if he could slay him man do you know what you're saying yes answered rayner with well affected surprise i am saying that in her inexperience this girl wife is thinking of contracting a flash marriage one in which her heart is engaged as it appears not to have been in the first of course she may not understand the law as it relates to bigamy or she may believe that her husband is dead who is the man asked bracknell in a strangled voice the man i do not understand do you mean the husband no the man whom she is thinking of marrying oh i see well that's the curious part of the whole business for this new lover is the cousin of her husband a one-time barrister but now out here in the mounted police what did you say a strange story yes it is that but there is one piquant detail that you have not yet heard sir what is that well it is this the husband as i informed you is the heir to an old estate in westmoreland he has a younger brother who since the elder's disappearance had slipped into the position of heir at least people had come to look upon him as such it being fairly well known that the elder could not return to claim the succession this younger son is dead dead the word came in a gasp from dick bracknell's lips and immediately after he was taken with a fit of coughing which lasted for some little time and left him exhausted with his face hidden in his hands your cough is very bad said rayner with affected sympathy are you sure that you wish me to continue this narrative bracknell lifted a tortured face and in his deep sunk eyes there was a moisture that was more than suspicious yes he said hoarsely go on as you wish replied rayner with affected solicitude and then continued as i was saying this younger son is dead how did he die interrupted bracknell something went wrong with his gun when he was out grouse shooting it burst i believe anyhow it killed him and by his death failing the succession of the older son the cousin becomes the heir and you have the rather unique situation of the cousin stepping into the shoes of the heir and the husband at one and at the same time quite a little drama in its way is it not dick bracknell's reply to the question was an inarticulate one and afterwards for a little time he stared into the fire with eyes that looked almost ferocious then he asked abruptly how do you know all this as i explained i am the representative of the firm of sir joseph rayner and son and i have been sent out to find the girl wife to find you or the girl yes she left england very suddenly a few weeks ago without informing sir joseph she 
as we have ascertained, came to the Dominion, and my principal suspecting that she was going to marry the man I have mentioned, sent me to intervene. Two courses are open for me to follow, either to find the young lady and explain to the former that in the absence of proof of her husband's death, such a marriage is of more than doubtful legality, or to find the policeman and point out that the young lady is already a wife. But he, what if he already knows? Then in that case I shall be called upon to explain the law to him also. But so far I have accomplished none of these things. The policeman, as I learned at Regina, is missing, and when I arrived there the young lady had already left her home up here for an unknown destination. I do not know, of course, but I have my suspicions as to who may be awaiting her at that destination. What do you mean? Well, sir, you appear to be a man of education, and you will remember that the great Anthony thought the world was lost for love, and what Cleopatra thought her actions proved. Human nature does not change, and love is the strongest passion it knows, and I suspect that her lover being missing, the young lady has gone to look for him, or if not that, to meet him at some appointed rendezvous. The two are young, between them, they will be fabulously rich, and they will not be the first pair of lovers to set the world and the world's conventions at defiance. At least, they will be able to afford it. Never, by never. The words came from the sick man's lips explosively. He rose from his seat and gripped Rayner's shoulder in a way that made him grimace with pain. Man, he cried, are you telling me the truth? Certainly, sir. Why? Do you know who I am? Bracknell's eyes, full of wild light, glared down into Rayner's, but the latter, as he lied, met them unflinchingly. I do not, sir. We have not exchanged. My name is Bracknell, Dick Bracknell, and I can guess it is my wife and my cousin of whom you have been talking. By, if I had him here, and to think that two days ago he was here, and that I let him go. He was here two days ago? Two days ago, and I let him go because he pitched the cock-and-bull story which I believed. And I might have known all the time that it was so much bunkum, just a yarn to get out of my hands. I ought to have killed him as he tried to kill me by poisoning my dogs. I remember now that once before when we met, he showed a tenderness for joy that was more than natural in a mere cousin by marriage. He suggested to me that I should make reparations to my wife by allowing her to divorce me. That was a very crafty suggestion on his part, broke in Rayner suavely. It would have cleared his own way to your wife. The sick man was stung to madness at the thought. His eyes burned and his face grew convulsed. Reparations, he cried hoarsely, in jealous rage, reparations, the viper. If I ever put my eyes on him again, I will. He broke off as a fit of coughing took him, and when it was over, he dropped to his seat utterly exhausted, gasping painfully for breath. The man whose lying story had brought on this attack watched him unmoved, and calculated cynically whether Bracknell's own estimate of the span of life remaining to him was correct. Then he said, I'm very sorry for you, Mr. Bracknell, but I cannot allow private wrongs to interfere with my own mission. You say that your cousin was here two days ago. Perhaps you can tell me which way he was traveling. He was going up the river to meet Joy, as like as not. Then I shall follow. Perhaps I shall meet the lady. If so, I shall be able to assure her that the marriage she is contemplating is quite out of the question. Say nothing to the man about my threats if you find him, said Bracknell, rousing himself. Say I've news for him, that I want him to see me as, by, I do. Tell him what you'd like, but get him to come back here. I will do my best, sir. If I had dogs, sick though I am, I'd follow him myself. But that's out of the question. I shall rely on you, too. You may, sir, broke in Rayner, obsequiously. If I find him, I will certainly induce him to come back to you, if I can. But I hope you will not be violent. Violent? Bring him here, Bracknell laughed, almost deliriously, and you will see. In the morning when Adrian Rayner took the trail, he looked back at the haggard man standing by the cabin door. Bracknell 
had been delirious in the night, and now as he stood there swaying, the other looked at him without pity. "'Booked,' he muttered to himself, and knows it. If Roger Bracknell should happen to return here, Harrow Fell will require a new heir, and I shall be saved from a disagreeable necessity. But that chance is not to be depended on. I must find him if I can. And as he followed the northward trail, there was an index of grim purpose in his face. End of chapter 18